This is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Tonight on Farage, we were promised last week a new energy strategy. Boris Johnson today goes to Saudi Arabia. Is that the right thing for the Prime Minister to be doing? Talks between Ukraine and Russia are yielding some dividends. It looks like Ukraine says they won't join NATO. Why on earth wasn't that done a month ago? And joining me on Talking Pines, the national, former National Security Advisor, Samar Lyle Grant. But before all of that, let's get the news. Andre Addison, here's all the latest from the GB newsroom. British Iranian aid worker Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe is now on her way home to Britain after leaving Iran. According to her husband, the first thing she's asked for is for him to make her a cup of tea when she arrives later on tonight. The British Iranian aid worker was held for six years. Fellow detainee Anoushe Ashuri was also released. Nazanin's husband and daughter say they're delighted. Huge relief. Huge relief that, that she's on a plane, that she's coming home, that she's free. And thank you to everyone who's been helping along the way. It's been a long journey that people have been keeping us um, following it on the news, on petitions with the government. Um, I've said some rough things over the years, um, but in the end, she's coming home. Many people have been campaigning for Nazanin's release. Speaking earlier in the Commons, a local MP, Tulip Sadiq, praised the whole family for their efforts during the ordeal. But most importantly, I want to pay tribute to my constituent, Richard Radcliffe, for his relentless campaigning, but I also think he's really set the bar high for all husbands. <laughs> can I say... Can I say to Nazanin, welcome home after six long years. And can I say to Gabriella, this time, mummy really is coming home. Yeah. Tulip Sadiq. President Biden says the US is committing $1 billion in security assistance for Ukraine, including drones and anti-aircraft systems. That's after Ukraine's president delivered a historic address to the US Congress. Speaking via a video link, Volodymyr Zelensky called for further military support and assistance following Russia's invasion. He also urged the United States to impose further sanctions against Russia. The RSPCA has issued a statement saying it has started the process of bringing a prosecution against West Ham defender Kurt Zuma and his brother Johan. They're being investigated over an alleged violation of the Animal Welfare Act. It's after footage emerged of the footballer slapping and kicking his pet cat. 
On TV online and on DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Farage. Good evening. Even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, energy was becoming a very important issue. Rocketing prices, inflation and much talk that our gas storage facility wasn't what it should be. Could we get into such a mess that one day the lights might even go out? And then, of course, then, of course, Russia invaded Ukraine. And now we're talking even more, I think, about energy security, the concept of us perhaps being self sufficient as a country in energy, something that I've argued for for many, many long years. Well, Boris Johnson responded to it last week by saying this. Uh, so next week, we're going to be setting out the, uh, the energy strategy for, uh, for the UK. Massive uh, jump forward on, uh, on renewables, uh, more nuclear, uh, using our own hydrocarbons uh, more effectively. Also looking at what we can do to source hydrocarbons from places other than Russia. We've got to get off uh, Russian hydrocarbons. Well, what is that new strategy? I'll tell you what it is. He's gone to Saudi Arabia. Yes, Boris Johnson's in Saudi Arabia. Boris Johnson, that great human rights campaigner, not worrying that 81 people were executed in Saudi Arabia last Saturday. No, he's gone to beg the Saudis, please start pumping more oil. Let's have some oil from you because we are weaning ourselves off Russian oil. Keir Starmer's responded by saying, going cap in hand from dictator to dictator is not an energy strategy. Now, that's really quite good for Keir Starmer, in my opinion. He says the Labour Party would take a fundamentally different approach, but he doesn't, for one moment, tell us what it is, and I don't think he's really got a clue. Boris Johnson will cheer himself up by saying there's going to be big Saudi investment in green energy in the north of England. But the truth of it is... We've gone begging to Saudi Arabia. I think a better solution would be let's start pumping more North Sea oil. No fresh investment in the North Sea for the last three years because the British government are against it because of their net zero strategy. Oh, and the Scottish government, Nicola Sturgeon, who for most of her political career has pinned Scottish separation on oil, has now turned against it as well. We should be producing our own energy. So my question to you is, is Boris right to go to Saudi Arabia? Let me know your views, farage at gbnews.uk. Now, the other issue that I've talked to you a lot about over the course of the last few weeks, months, indeed I spoke about in the European Parliament seven or eight years ago repeatedly, was my view, my belief that the ever eastwards expansion of the European Union, and more significantly even than that, NATO, was actually a mistake. Interestingly, overnight, we have President Zelensky saying that he accepts that Ukraine is not going to join NATO. Even Boris Johnson now saying that it's not for the foreseeable future realistic that Ukraine will join NATO. Why on earth wasn't this said a month ago when we knew there were up to 150,000 Russian soldiers surrounding Ukraine and the real causus belli, the real rallying cry from Putin to the Russian people is they're surrounding us, they're threatening us, they're going to expand NATO. Why didn't we do it then? I don't fully understand it. I'm joined now by Ewan Grant, a former law enforcement intelligence analyst. Ewan, welcome to the no, programme. Glad to be here. So the main cause or the main excuse, perhaps that's a better way of putting it, because I, you know, by the way, what I say NATO shouldn't have expanded to the east the way that it did, um, I don't support Putin and his behaviour at all. I just think we made, I believe, a bit of a mistake. Why are you and are they now saying Ukraine's not going to join NATO? Why, why couldn't they do it before? Well, that's a fair point, um, because Ukraine was always different um, because of its size and its location in a way that the other ex-Soviet states weren't. And remember, of course, the Baltic states had been independent between the two wars, yep. and Britain and America never recognised their annexation after it or during it. Uh, so there is an issue there. This probably could have been resolved by diplomacy. But remember, of course, Ukraine 
fears Russia with reasons that Russia doesn't have to fear Ukraine. It only has to fear it ideologically, not physically, mm. because Ukraine or people coming through Ukraine are simply not going to invade Russia. No, and that was never on the cards. Obviously, the hugely contested provinces in the eastern part of Ukraine, predominantly Russian-speaking, and we're getting this, this, these negotiations that are taking place now between Russia and Ukraine. So if NATO's taken off the table, and if Ukraine effectively becomes a neutral country, a buffer state, yeah. you know, I can now see there is some potential agreement uh, between the two sides on that, and, and, and one or two slightly more optimistic noises being made even by Lavrov on that. How do they deal? How do they find a solution to those... Well, are they contested eastern provinces? Russia certainly say they are. Well, it's interesting to note the Russians played a very clever game in... Let's get this right. Was it Mariupol or Melitopol, which is to the west of Mariupol? They've occupied, but it's not, it's not under siege. They... Whereas Mariupol has suffered terribly. Yes, indeed. There's still the fighting there. I'm pretty sure it was Melitopol. They put in a puppet mayor who very cleverly they have chosen because she has a Ukrainian name. But the existing mayor was a Russian speaker with a Russian name, mm. and he was the resisting the Russians. So... It's complicated. There's a dangerous argument the Russians are making there. Do you think there is... A, I mean, you know, clearly the Russian army, four generals, we now know, have been killed, which is, which is a big number, at least, a big number. Uh, Putin is reported to have sacked a further eight generals. So, clearly, militarily, it is not going as well as they would have liked it to. Do you actually think there's a prospect now of... And I, I was discussing this earlier in the week, because it does seem to me, potentially, the terms for peace are there. Well, I'm a natural pessimist. I tend to look at the glass half empty rather than full. I must say I've changed my mind. I thought they would get a de facto partition along the river with all the implications yeah. for threatening Odessa and cutting off the trade. I think now there is perhaps a chance and that Ukraine, a bit like Finland in 1939-40, has saved itself with help from us, with help from the West, not least the UK, remember, not yeah, yeah. least the UK, but uh, largely by itself. Interesting. And could we see a situation where perhaps those eastern provinces were given, would perhaps the prospect of a referendum overseen by the UN, would that perhaps be a way or not? I think that's realistic. Whether it's the right thing to do, of course, Ukrainians and Russians and, of course, the different languages spoken in those, countries, in those regions, I don't want to say different ethnicities, it's not as simple as that. They might agree or disagree, but um, he's used force, he's achieved something. Will what he has achieved satisfy him? and the power brokers behind him. Hmm. Has it boosted him or not? Hopefully, it's, it's been the reverse. Hmm, it's I been a I, serious setback. I, su I suspect that's right. And finally, Ewan, who should the broker be? Who should the international peacemaker and broker be that goes in between these two, two sides and thrashes out? It'll be some very interesting people with um, fingers in every pile. Look particularly at China, look particularly at Turkey. And, and remember, of course, as we know with the Uyghurs, there's a Turkish, big Turkish community in Western China. And look at the Israelis, and not just the oligarchs, but the Israeli links with Russia and Ukraine go back a long way. Interesting point. Well, maybe. But perhaps not the Europeans. No, well, I don't think that's... US. No, no, that's not going to work. Ewan Grant, it's good to hear somebody who's pessimistic, being mildly optimistic at thank this you. moment in time. And thank you very much indeed. Energy. I started at the top of the show with energy. And joining me now is Clive Moffat, gas consultant and former advisor to the government on energy security. Um, and Clive, you've kind of produced your own white paper um, on what you think uh, we now need <laughs> to do. Uh, a week ago, Boris Johnson, for the first time I can ever remember talking about energy independence and plans to be unveiled quickly. 
And you may have heard what I said at the top of the show. He's gone off to Saudi Arabia to beg them to pump more oil. Has Boris got this right? I, right, well, we managed I to keep it on topic and not hear, to hear much from the Brits. that um, the government is prepared to have a look at energy policy in the wake of the Ukrainian crisis. Um, I get, um, I was not so um, excited when I heard a government spokesman say, well, really, our long term objective remains net zero by 2050. And so I. I think really what the Ukrainian crisis has done is underline the fact that we are going to be continually dependent on natural gas for heating and power. And that the gas has an important transitional role to play over the next 20, 20 years. And what we should be doing in this review is identifying what can be done in a relatively short space of time to rectify the imbalance in generation and insecurity of supply. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you're right, of course, in all of the statements we've seen over the course of the last week, uh, there have been, uh, you know, constant references to we're sticking to the net zero plan. And maybe the use of this term energy independence is to sort of, you know, quieten down those on the back benches that are getting angry, elements of the national press uh, that are getting angry, but you make the point in your paper that natural gas will have a continuing and critical role to play in the energy mix. What about nuclear? Because we have heard some different words on nuclear, uh, and it was interesting, I thought, that exchange that we had last week in the Commons, when Johnson yes. said we're for nuclear and the opposition said we're for nuclear. Um, isn't the problem with that, that even if we say, yes. right... Let's reinvest in well, nuclear. It's five, yeah, six, seven, eight years before any of that comes online. Well, Treasury have always had second thoughts about big nuclear, and which is the reason why we haven't had any more plants after Hinkley. Um, and in fact, why Hinkley was even under the microscope a few years back as to whether or not it should continue. Yeah. I think the problem with nuclear, the big nuclear, and I'm talking two gigawatt level of nuclear, Plants is they take a long time to build, they're incredibly expensive. Um, and either you open up a 30 year subsidy for electricity price, which is consumers have to bear, or you end up having to contribute significantly to what could be um, a, a, a capital cost, which nobody's quite clear how big it would be. And I think there is, um, if you look Oh, seem extremely expensive if you take into account the existing. And yet, on Clive, smaller nuclear, gone... I mean, there has been. Sorry, Nigel. Yeah, I say, I say, the French have gone for nuclear, haven't they, in a very, very big way, and they're reinvesting in nuclear. Uh, and it does at least, and whatever the cost and the risks, it does at least give them guaranteed electricity supply, so much so they export much of the excess or some of the excess to the UK. Yes, it does. I mean, it is essentially, I can't argue the fact that it doesn't produce any carbon dioxide. But what it, um, it they do take an incredibly long time to build. Um, they, they're ne never normally not built, built on time or to budget. And I think um, experts, not only myself, have said maybe the time has come for us to, to say, OK, Hinkley will have, but no more after Hinkley. The other question that's been raised by government is the issue of smaller nuclear reactors, 300 megawatts, having lots of them. The problem with that is that the, we don't have the manufacturing base or the supply chain robustness to produce, to economies of scale, that number of modular reactors. If we had a huge export market willingly to buy our modular reactors, then Rolls-Royce could look forward to being able to produce these modular reactors by the way, the technology is not proven yet, despite what they say. That um, yeah, but, right. without that, we don't. We, we're still going to cost the same amount in subsidy. I would, I would envisage than the larger ones in terms of um, cost per kilowatt hour. Yeah, and, and a, a final thought from you, if I can, Clive. Do you think it's right for the British Prime Minister uh, to be there in Saudi Arabia, effectively begging them to up production? 
and sell some of it to us. Well, I suppose in some ways, if you, you know, it, 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 it's the obvious reaction every time we've had a, um, a situation where the oil price has escalated to this level. There has always been a case of why don't we put OPEC under the pressure and try and make them increase production. Um, I can't recollect uh, exactly how successful we've been with that, even at the time of the 70s oil crisis. And um, so I think it's, it, it's optimistic, to say the least, <laughs> that that will happen. Well, we'll find out. Clive Moffat, as ever, thank you for joining us in a moment. A slightly happier story. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, after six years in an Iranian jail, is on an aeroplane back to the United Kingdom. How did that happen? GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Is Boris Johnson right to go to Saudi Arabia? Is this our new energy independence policy? Chris says, yes, he is right. All the woke academic virtues signalling interference causes wars. They've got oil. We have arms. Let's trade. Jonathan says, it's better the devil you know scenario in the name of oil searching. Tommy says to me, what choice does he have? It's a quandary and a half. Produce more of our own is the answer to that. Tony says, of course he's right to go. He's trying to keep the country running. At least he's doing something and not sitting on his backside, moaning like the opposition and the do-gooders. Yes, I'll grant you that, absolutely. Kenneth says, a coal plant with a CO2 scrubber is net zero. Boris should be digging for coal instead of begging for oil. Now, we got the news earlier on this morning that Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe and Anoushe Ashuri, two British-Iranian detainees, are on their way back and they'll be coming in to RAF Bryce Norton in Oxfordshire. And I'm joined there right now by Ellie Costello, GB News's South East reporter. Ellie, what time are we expecting Nazanin back in the country? And what kind of reception committee is they going to be? 
Well, good evening, Nigel. Happy and joyful news today that Nazneen Zaghari Ratcliffe will be coming home on that flight into RAF Bryce Norton. We're expecting her a little bit later on tonight. We're expecting her around midnight. That time is changing, but there is that huge sense of joy and relief here that Nazneen is finally coming home. And when she takes that step off the plane onto the tarmac here at RAF Bryce Norton, that will be the last step in what has been a horrific six-year ordeal for the wife and mother. We know that she was subject to solitary confinement, unfair trial and psychological torture whilst she was in Iran. And she was not alone. You speak there, Nigel, about a second Iranian-British citizen who will be on that plane tonight. Uh, he has also been detained on spy charges similar to Nazanin. He has been held there for five years too. He will also be reunited with his family in London tonight and there will be celebrations with their family, I'm sure, who have had the most anxious few days, few weeks, indeed few years waiting for their loved ones to come home. Now, their release is linked to the payment of that historic £400 million debt that the United Kingdom owed Iran. And it's taken three prime ministers and five foreign ministers to finally have that paid. But that was confirmed by Liz Trust earlier today. And Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe is on her flight home. She will be reunited with her family, her beloved husband, Richard, who has gone on hunger strike twice in a dedicated appeal for his wife to come home. And they will be so glad to have Nazanin in their arms once more tonight. They certainly will. Ellie Costello, thank you very much indeed for that report. So, she mentioned the £400 million, this money that we've owed Iran, it's been contested. It's now been paid. Why now? Well, David Hay, the human rights lawyer and former managing director of Leeds United Football Club, joins me on the line now. David, um, is this virtually a ransom? I mean, is that the way that we've been treated um, over this by Iran? Well, I, think, I think the politicians have been very careful to try and suggest that that's not actually the case. But what we do know is that that money has now been paid and it hadn't been paid before. And after it was paid, they've been released. So what message does that send to other despots and dictators holding our British detainees? Yeah, no, I fully get that. I mean, I, I, I genuinely feel that it is like a ransom. Um, and why, why now? I mean, Iran, it, it does seem that the Biden administration take a much more positive view about Iran, certainly when Donald Trump did. Uh, there's talk of perhaps the Iran nuclear deal being put back on. Is this part of Iran trying to show the West we're nice guys, really? I think it's, it's, very, it's very suspicious timing, particularly, I think, if you look at what's happening in Russia at the moment, the need for oil, the need for other friends, and the need that you obviously see Boris at the moment looking in, in going to Saudi and the UAE and making friends with other dictators and despots who have oil. And obviously, Iran does. I may be being paranoid there, but it's, I think it's very suspicious timing. It's a, it, as you know, she's been detained for six years. Her husband has campaigned tirelessly for her release. And all of a sudden, now we've fallen out with Russia, we find that Iran is suddenly uh, some, some, somewhat friendly to us. Yeah, and yet we still know, don't we? I mean, pretty much for certain that the human rights abuses in Iran are, well, frankly, uh, bordering on the barbaric in many cases. Um, we still know uh, that Iran has been a major sponsor of terrorism um, across the whole region. Uh, I mean, what's your view, David? Do you think we should be trying to renegotiate some, t some kind of deal with them, or are they just beyond the pale? I think I think we're we're in a uh, quite uncertain times now with what's happening in, in in Russia and Ukraine at the moment, and 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 you see Boris going to other like like I said, other dictators and despots, yeah. and you know I would put Iran in exactly the same box as I would put Saudi, and exactly the same box as I would put the UAE. The UAE and Saudi just have better PR firms. It's, it's as simple as that. They're, they're, they're you know they're, they're suspiciously similar when you look at the war in Yemen. So I think it's. It's, you know, an interesting policy development, but it's one that's, in this stage today, has got a very happy ending. You've got Nazanin on a plane coming back yeah. home to see her family. And that's, that's, you know, particularly in these troubling times, I think it's a joy that all of us want to see. Absolutely. No, 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 no. And, I, 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 you know, I introduced this as being a happy story, of course, and it is very much so. But I suppose, David, overall, when we really think about it, economic considerations and trade, at the end of the day, 
do we have to care more about that than human rights in those countries? The, the, and the, but that's that's the, exactly the point, and you see that many many times. And the, the, you, Nazani is just one of the many Brits that are detained across the world, and the Foreign Office is is not fit for purpose when it comes to protecting Brits detained abroad. And it all boils down to that. At the end of the day, it boils down to whether it's trade and commerce or whether it's the rights of the Brits yeah. that are detained in those countries. What takes precedence? You know, we have many Brits detained in Saudi, in the UAE, in countries around the world. What's more important? And, and that's the issue that you have. David Hay, thank you for joining me. We will be debating that very moral dilemma, I have no doubt, for many, many years to come. Thank you. So, we, hope we sort of turn to a what the Farage moment. The National Crime Agency, yes, they're advising us that if you're selling boats, if you're in the boat chandlery business, and you see buyers looking to pay in cash, you see repeat or bulk purchases of boats, you should become very suspicious because you see what happens is criminals buy these boats and use them for people trafficking across the English Channel. The trouble is, National Crime Agency, the boats are coming the other way. And goodness me, they're back coming the other way. Here are clips from Dover this morning. A very busy day across the Channel yesterday. A very busy day again today. Estimated to be 650 people uh, that have crossed over the English Channel in the last two days. The number probably in the end will turn out to be higher than that. Um, boats being intercepted, boats making it all the way across and landing on Kent beaches. Um, and it's the same old pattern. It's going to be around about 90% young men with no documentation or ID of any kind at all. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? that they will get put up in hotels or wherever at a huge cost of a taxpayer. Yet the genuine refugees that will be coming from Ukraine will be housed predominantly with British families at a cost of a taxpayer that is a few hundred pounds. Um, and I have to say, uh, I have to say there is a massive difference, in my opinion, between the two. But if you thought the channel crisis had gone away, it hasn't. And the forecast over the next few days is for, for some very, very calm weather. Now, who ever thought that a steam train could be racist, could be uh, giving us terrible memories of our appalling, shameful colonial history? Well, I have to say uh, that in Wales, uh, that is the case uh, because, <laughs> unbelievably, uh, Richard Trevithick's locomotive, built in 1804, that was working in coal mines at that time. Um, and we're told by the National Museum of Wales, that this invention is rooted in colonialism and racism. And even though uh, the inventor had no links to the slave trade whatsoever, there's going to be a big notice put up so that when you go and see this invention, this working steam engine from 1804, rather than being quite proud of what we did in the past, you're supposed to feel ashamed. Now, one man who perhaps has been shamed is Labour peer Lord Young. Yes, he was in the House of Lords this week. And let's have a look at what was going on in debates in the House of Lords this week with Lord Young. Fascinating. Scare quotes around the term technically flawed and suggest that that was a particularly um, you, um, grave insult in your Lordship's house. Well, I'm afraid I think this statutory instrument is technically flawed. Now, the language of the Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committee is typically very measured and very calm, as you would usually expect. But what the committee does is regrets. Well, I state my position as somebody who is a, um, a Remainer. But if there's two things that I welcome in coming out of the common market, one is the CAP and this particular um, gene editing. I'm sorry, but the noble lord was fast asleep for the entire duration of the minister's speech. He really should not participate in this debate, having failed to take, take advantage of the ability to today. I'm afraid the noble lord was fast asleep for the entirety of the minister's um, opening speech. Well, I had to send a note to you in order to wake you up by the doorkeeper. Well, well done, Lady Bloomfield, for calling him out. He was fast asleep throughout the whole debate and yet wanted to get up and speak as if he was an expert 
introducing himself as a Remainer. You see, they haven't given up. They haven't given up in the House of Lords. Many haven't given up in the House of Commons. But we can say to them very clearly, the war is over. There's no going back. But I thought, well done, you know, for saying you shouldn't be in this debate as you slept off your lunch for the whole of the afternoon. Now, more good news, real good news. And this is that British Airways have announced, yes, thank goodness, you're not going to have to wear face masks. Isn't that great news? Get that face mask off. Absolutely. I flew to America and back with British Airways just a couple of weeks ago, and it was masks on all the way there and masks on all the way back unless you were eating or drinking. So I made sure that I was drinking water, obviously, all the way out there. Some more thoughts, and if you believe that, you believe anything. Some more thoughts on whether Boris Johnson was right to go to Saudi Arabia. And by the way, I'm not against him going. I just think it looks a bit humiliating. And I do think the answer lies here. We have got enough gas and oil, not just to, to, to sustain us for decades to come, but to become a net exporter. What a prize that would be. Think of the tens of thousands of well-paid jobs. Right, your responses. Philip says, Boris is right only if he uses the two or three... Does it for two or three years. Saudi oil gives us independence from Russian blackmail to develop our own energy resources. So an argument being made there that what we're doing actually is buying a bit of time. Yep, there is some logic to that. Mark says, Boris should definitely not go begging to the Middle East for oil. It makes more sense to invest in our own North Sea oil wells and be totally self-sufficient. Alex says, we rely on America for lots and they execute people too. Yes, Boris is doing the right thing. You're right, there are some states in America that exercise the death penalty, uh, but they exercise it, I have to say, uh, very sparingly in terms of numbers. 81 in one day. Uh, many of whom we believe were beheaded with swords. I don't you think the Americans do that. Nigel says a big yes. He's thinking of our 60 million plus inhabitants who need oil products. Well done. And finally, John says, should Boris have gone to Saudi Arabia? No. Open up the North Sea. How about Canadian oil? And how about starting fracking? Well, as soon as you hear that word fracking, or as soon as you hear actually any onshore gas production, it seems that most members of parliament get a fit of the vapours. And yet, I kind of think out there in the real world, views are changing. Now, joining me in a moment, a former national security advisor. So a hell of a lot to talk about when Sir Mark Lyle Grant joins me in a moment on Talking Pipes. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. 
And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. The bell has rung, the GB News Tavern is open, and I'm joined tonight by Samart Lal Grant, former senior diplomat and national security advisor. Samart, welcome. Thank you. To Talking Pints and GB News. Good evening. Now, you joined the diplomatic service many years ago. How, do, how does that happen? How does one do this? Well, it happened a little bit by accident for me, to be honest, because I did law at university and I qualified as a barrister mm -hmm. and I was called to the bar. And at the same time, just for the fun of it, because I was one of these sort of guys who likes taking exams, I took the Foreign Office uh, exams. I'd thought of doing that at university, but I broke my hand just before and couldn't do them. So when I was in London doing the bar exams, I thought I'd take the Foreign Office exams. And I think because I wasn't really ever intending to join the Foreign Office, I managed to get through the exams and the process and was offered a job. And they were offering me the princely sum of £5,000 a year. I'm just thinking, if you've just been called to the bar, you could have made quite a lot more money if you, if you stayed in Certainly law. would have made a lot more money, but not initially. And I was, I'd done a postgraduate course in, in Brussels in EU law. And uh, so I was 24. I was still dependent on my parents. And uh, the Foreign Office was offering sort of instant independence yeah. rather than at the bar. In those days, you weren't paid for the first sort of couple of right. years. Yeah. Although, of course, in the end, you would have earned a lot more money. Actually. Yeah. Yeah, so the Foreign Office it was, and, and I guess, you know, I mean, because I worked in Brussels for years and I've interacted with the Foreign Office, it's not always been that, well, it's always been civil. <laughs> we may not have agreed on much, but it's always, yeah, it has always been civil, actually, as it should be. But one looks at the Foreign Office, it's a very elitist organisation, isn't it? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think it was at one point, and certainly in my intake, the sort of uh, graduate intake was all white and it was all male. But that has changed very significantly. And now I think ten, the 10 most senior ambassadorial posts overseas are held by women. Right. And there's a lot of uh, senior officers from ethnic minorities as well. So no, it's a very much more diverse organization than it was when I joined 40 years ago. And to get into the Foreign Office, you've got to pass that exam still. It's an open exam and yeah. uh, everyone can apply. Yeah. Uh, it's an online exam at the first stage and they whittle that down from, say, 60,000 down to sort of a couple of thousand. And then there's various exercises and interviews and things like that. So it's rigorous, but it is completely open and anyone can apply. Fair enough. And you've worked... have to be a British national. Oh, yes. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you've worked all over the world, postings in Pakistan and goodness knows where else. Um, so you obviously care deeply about all those places that you've been to. You also served at the United Nations. Um, I'm guessing that the last, the last few years must have been quite a trauma for you, really, because the course that was set in terms of our membership of the evolving European Union, uh, the belief in quite big globalist structures, um, it's been fractured in quite a big way, hasn't it, by the Brexit vote, by, you know, a much bigger debate. And I'm thinking that perhaps one of the impacts from the Russian invasion of Ukraine is we genuinely will start thinking more about energy independence, for argument's sake, a point that I was just debating earlier in yeah. the show. Uh, we'll rely far less on global just-in-time supply chains. There's going to be a change of thinking towards much more of a national perspective. Yes. And, and, and that is a challenge for a foreign office that's been set on a particular route for decades. Well, you're right uh, in one way that I joined in 1980 and there's been three seminal events really since then. The Falklands War was absolutely seminal mm. in allowing Margaret Thatcher to have the time to turn around the British economy and it fundamentally changed most diplomats' career from potentially managing decline, as everyone talked about yeah. in the 1970s, yeah. to suddenly representing a country that meant something that had a lot of influence. Then you had the fall of the Berlin Wall, obviously absolutely critical. Yeah. And the third one was certainly for the United Kingdom was Brexit. Mm. Uh, and that has changed a great deal. But interestingly, although personally I think it's a strategic mistake, mainly for economic reasons, that's my personal view, I have always said, and I've said this publicly, and I said it at the time, that in terms of Britain's influence in the world or its national security, 
there is no reason why Brexit per se should damage either of those two things. And I can explain why, if you like. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking about that because I'm quite struck, and I'll sort of throw this back at you for a second. I'm quite struck that in terms of foreign policy, over the course of the last decade, well, 15 years probably, we were getting closer and closer to a European position. It was a European position on Zimbabwe. It was a European position on Putin and Russia. You know, we weren't speaking independently as a country. And I, I don't need you, please disagree with me, but I kind of feel that the AUKUS deal with Australia, actually the Ukraine, where, and whatever one thinks of Boris Johnson's leadership on, on other aspects of, of, of domestic life, but actually, when it comes to the Ukrainian issue, and whether they, whether they got it right or wrong is irrelevant, in the sense that they actually were quite decisive, quite out there, uh, giving leadership. And in a sense, it was America. I felt it was America and the European Union following the lead that we were giving. So doesn't this kind of show... You, you did say that your principal reason for wishing to stay was economic. Yeah. Uh, and, and we could debate that forever, but we're, we're just not going to. Um, but... but Actually, aren't we already beginning to gain a bit more self-confidence on the world stage with Brexit in terms of foreign policy? I think it's a bit early to come to that conclusion, but certainly, and I was in New York as ambassador to the UN at mm. the time of the Scottish referendum, there's no doubt in my mind that Scottish independence would be much more damaging both to our security and to our international standing than Brexit uh, ever could be. I mean, you're right to some extent, I think, to say that we have greater autonomy now. We have more opportunity to set out our own positions. But what we've lost is the ability to influence the EU positions. Because without us... They never listened the EU, to us, did Oh, they? well, you would be surprised how much influence we had, particularly in the foreign and security area, because we were the biggest defence spenders in Europe. We had a huge clout as alongside the French. And we had huge clout on things like competition and open trade alongside the northern uh, Europeans. So without us, the risk is that the European Union will shift its position. We won't necessarily shift our position. Some people say we'll get closer to the Americans. I don't think we will. I think our position is our position, but the Europeans will move further away from the Americans without us. Yes. That is why the Dutch and the Swedes and the Poles are so upset uh, at us leaving. Do you think the EU will be there in 10 years' time? I think it will. I think there's a huge political impetus behind it. Uh, oh, it I know that. Fundamentally a <laughs> it is fundamentally Having against a it. political <laughs> process. <laughs> and the political will between France and Germany in particular, because of the history, uh, is so strong that it will survive. Uh, absolutely sure. Well, we'll see. I'm sure it'll be, if it does survive, it's going to have to adapt and change. Now, after your stint um, over on second in Manhattan... National Security Advisor. I'm in a heck of a job yeah. to take on and amazing, an amazing job to have. And yet, your time there was a time when we began to see a rise of extremist Islamic terrorism. Yep. Uh, we began to see, I think, actually, for the first time in many, many years, some genuine fear. You know, do we get the tube train or in London or don't? I mean, that sort of thing was happening. And yet... And I was, you know, sort of count our chickens, but there have in the last couple of years, few years, been surprisingly few of these attacks. Is that evidence that our intelligence services are on top of this? I mean, they can never be totally on top of it, I get. But are we kind of on top of this? I wouldn't come to that conclusion exactly. I think what is evident is that we went through a period of very extreme terrorist attacks, Islamist mainly terrorist attacks, mm -hmm. um, and also rising cyber attacks. And what is interesting about those two threats, as opposed to, say, the threat from Russia or the threat from China, mm -hmm. is that the government cannot really 100% keep its people safe. It can do a lot, and the government has done a lot, and we did a lot when I was there in terms of reinforcing the intelligence services, better coordination between law enforcement and intelligence, uh, setting up the National Cyber Security Centre, yep. first time to help business. So there's a lot the government can do, but the reality is that if an individual takes a knife, goes out in the street, starts stabbing people, off the radar, as it were, there is very little the government can do to do it. And that's why I think there, there was a time when the sense of personal insecurity went up in this country 
despite the fact in a strategic mm. sense, the country has never been safer. And yeah, I think people got more upset with those that committed terrible atrocities, London Bridge being one example, where some of these people were known already to the authorities. And that led to a feeling, well, well hang on, if we know about these people, why aren't we doing more? Well, because we know about a lot of people and you can't put everyone under 24-hour surveillance, can't which is extremely resource-intensive. Therefore, you have to make choices the whole time. And MI5 mm. are making choices the whole time about where are the priority threats. Most of the time, they get it absolutely right. Um, as you rightly say, there have been very few terrorist attacks, deadly terrorist attacks mm. in the UK mercifully. in recent yeah. years, mercifully. And something like 30 really quite developed terrorist attacks have been thwarted in the last four years. And that is a sign that... Mm. You can never say you're on top of it because it's a continuing threat and it won't go away in our generation, that, that is for certain. But nonetheless, I think the government has the right approach to it. 650 people have crossed the English Channel in dinghies in the last two days. Haven't got the numbers yet. It'll be 90% young men. They'll be between 16 and 28. Uh, none of them will have a passport. We won't have a clue where any of them come from. We won't know whether they uh, genuinely are fleeing something awful or whether they were fighting for ISIS two or three years back. Um, how concerned should we be about that? The numbers are still relatively small, and we mustn't lose sight of that perspective. Well, have a look at this. The this, vast... this is today's Samark, and, and, you know, yeah. we but now the... learn that the figure for last year has been revised upwards, the nearly yeah. 30,000. Yeah. Estimates this year it could be 60,000. Yeah. It's quite a lot of people. It's quite a lot of people, but, look, there's been a million in Germany. There's yeah. hundreds of thousands in France and in Spain and in Italy. Mm. So we are relatively well protective because of our geographical position from these inflows of uh, illegal uh, migrants. It doesn't feel like it. I, it may not feel like it uh, to some people, but the reality is um, that we need a lot of immigration, legal immigration. This illegal immigration needs to be stopped. But the real problem is where is it stopped? And in my view, the French government have not always done as much as they should do because those who are fleeing from France to the UK cannot claim that they're coming from an unsafe environment to a safe one, because they're perfectly safe. And that in principle... They that... want to come. And that principle of the first yeah. uh, country yes. of uh, yes. refuge is being breached all over the place. And you can understand why, because southern European countries are saying, well, just by accident of geography, we are getting the vast majority, mm. and you in Britain or, or Netherlands, say, or Sweden, are not getting as many, and you should share the burden. And this was a great uh, problem for us when we were in the European Union. We opted out from the Schengen Agreement precisely so that we could keep yeah. some control of it. Yeah. But it's caused huge problems in the rest of the EU with people arguing about I who know, should take what. And, of course, the migrants want to go maybe to Germany, because that's a place where you can get a well-paid job, or they might want to come to the UK because they've got relatives or friends in the UK. Well, I think it's called the benefit system, isn't it? And I think our benefit system is very much more generous than they're going to get in any other European country. Um, and all the while, <laughs> and also, uh, you know, the fact that we don't really deport anybody anymore. There are lots of reasons why. I just wonder, sort of finally thinking the really big picture of what's going on, was NATO expansion, continual NATO expansion to the east, was it a mistake? No, I don't think it was a mistake. I mean, one forgets the trauma that many of these countries went through mm. before 1989. Suddenly, the Berlin Wall fell down. They had the opportunity to join uh, institutions that they wanted to join, and many wanted to join NATO. Most of them, in fact. No, I, and the European way, Union. I get that. I get that. And NATO is a completely defensive alliance. And when President Putin claims that he feels threatened by NATO, this is rubbish. This invasion of Ukraine is all about protecting the Putin rule, mm. the Putin regime. Mm. And as part of what he considers, to coin a phrase, if excuse the phrase, to make Russia great again. That's what he wants. He wants to put back the old Russian empire. No, because he does. It's no, nothing I, to do with no, security. Of course he does. I mean, I mean, look, I, you know, seven or eight years ago, I was saying in the European Parliament, I thought we would, we would provoke him into war. Doesn't justify in any way what he's done. How does this end, do you think? How do you sort of, looking into the crystal ball, at least there are some negotiations going on, the Russian military having a tougher time. What's the way out of this? Well, Putin is going to lose, undoubtedly. But unfortunately, that does not mean that Ukraine will win. I mean, Ukraine has lost massively already. You know, yeah. Tens of thousands of civilians killed, uh, cities destroyed, yeah, millions of refugees. It's horrendous. 
But I think President Zelensky has been quite sensible and statesmanlike in what he said um, in the last couple of days, that all conflicts end in some form of agreement. Mm. And he's right about that. And therefore, these talks are a way out. Quite what the terms of that agreement will be and how long this conflict will last is virtually impossible no, to predict good. at this stage. It is. So, Mark, we may disagree on many things with worldview. We've had a very civilised conversation here on Talking Pints, and thank you for coming in. Thank you. Yeah. Right, it was very good. It's Barrage the Farrage, the last couple of minutes of the programme. Let's see what we've got tonight. Dulcie asks, do you think it's right that companies such as Coca-Cola, McDonald's, etc., boycott Russia? Well, it's their choice, isn't it? And they want to punish. Um, there's a younger generation, a younger generation in Moscow that look very different when you see them on the television to their grandparents' generation, and they, they kind of somewhat want Western things, don't they? They do, and I think the, the big advantage of this sort of move by private companies is it will impact on that younger generation. Yeah, absolutely. We'll think, what is happening when, because of the actions of our leader... Yeah. I can't go to McDonald's. I mean, you can't get Netflix, and can't get McDonald's. Exactly. I mean, there's, 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 there's no life left. So it's quite an effective sanction. No, I, I, I think with the younger people, it may well be. Fraser asks, will Donald Trump make America great again, again, by winning in 2024? Well, I have to say, not only is Biden the most hopeless duffer, but I was watching uh, Nancy Pelosi doing a press conference last night, and that was no better. The Democrats are in real trouble. There's nobody of any real power likely to succeed. There's even talk of Hillary coming back. Um, so Trump, love him or hate him, uh, has actually been right about a few things. He's in a powerful position, and I won't embarrass our guest by bringing him in on that one, because he'd rather not, I know. John asks, what do you think that Ukrainians... Do you think that the Ukrainians will trust the West in the future after the 94 deal to give up their nuclear arsenal? It's a very fair question, isn't it? We promised them. It is a fair question. It's the, it's the Budapest Memorandum yes. that he's referring to in 1994, which said that we would guarantee the sovereignty of Ukraine in exchange for them giving up nuclear weapons. They gave up nuclear weapons and their sovereignty has been inviolated. Yeah. No, I, I, I absolutely agree. 30 seconds left. What is your favourite film? I always love The Ipcrest File because I'm fascinated by the security services and all of those things. And there's a new version out, and I haven't seen it yet. What's your favourite film? I have seen it, actually. But, no, my favourite film is uh, Shawshank Redemption. There we go. That is the end of the programme. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Mark Stein next, live from Ukraine. First, though, let's get the all-important weather. Hello again, I'm Adam McGiven. Widespread rain has affected many parts of the UK during Wednesday, but that rain clears overnight and then a chilly night to come, followed by a fine Thursday for the vast majority. A couple of weather fronts still slowly moving across the UK and the weather clearing up from the west, but I think for the rest of the evening, it's still wet across many parts of eastern England as the rain slowly moves into the North Sea. Cloud eventually clearing as well. And then a gap between weather systems. Many places clear overnight, light winds as well. Perhaps one or two fog patches. More widespread, we'll see a frosty start with temperatures at or around freezing. Now, we start off Thursday with that chill in the air, but plenty of sunshine for Scotland, England and Wales. Northern Ireland sees cloudier skies from the word go, some showers here. And those showers push into Scotland, falling as snow over the hills. One or two showers affecting northern England and north Wales as well. But to the south of that, we keep the sunny skies into the afternoon and temperatures will rise to 15 or 16 Celsius. So feeling very pleasant indeed compared to Wednesday's weather. But it turns colder in the north and northwest of Scotland as further showers arrive, falling as hail, sleet and snow in places, but eventually fading away during Thursday evening so that for most, again, Thursday night into the start of Friday is dry with long clear spells and temperatures falling close to freezing where we get those clear skies. But for Wales, Western England, I think a bit more cloud cover remaining, so perhaps frost free here. That area of cloud across Wales and western England tends to drift slowly north during Friday. It breaks up to allow sunny spells. And it's just an area of fair weather cloud, basically. For many places, Friday's looking dry, plenty of sunshine, 16 Celsius in the south, 12 in the north, and Saturday, Sunday also looking sunny and increasingly warm as well.
GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that